Our theme today is make responsible choices, which sounds like we just turned a page in the Sunday school book, doesn't it? Like it make, makes me think of when I was teaching Sunday school and there's no scripture more fitting to reflect on today as we move through Exodus than Exodus 20, which is the Ten Commandments. You know, it contains the first set of rules for mankind as we know it, penned by Moses and God, and historians think a couple of other people probably. So um, known, it's known in Christianity as the Decalogue. I have to say that right because I want to say it. Decagog, Decalog. These are a set of biblical principles relating to ethics and worship that are fundamental in both Judaism and Christianity. We have the same history. This is what we think of as most fundamental connection of us to um, the Jewish faith. This text appears twice. It actually appears a bunch of times in different denominations in Christianity with some variations and it occurs once in Exodus and then again in Deuteronomy almost exactly the same. So I have a couple of fun facts that I found. Um, the oldest existing copy, physical copy of the Ten Commandments is dated between 30 and 1 BC. The suggested date of the origination of it, which really honestly they have no idea, is 586 BC. It's a total guess. There's like a 0% chance that that's probably right. The idea of calling them commandments was actually a much more recent English term The original translation means the 10 words or the 10 verses. There's a lot of different examples of the 10 whatevers, but the use of the word commandment is, and I can kind of see that commandment in the early English churches would have been a more stern instructional way of sort of conveying their significance and their importance. So, the tablets that they were scripturally, scripturally referred to having been written on were referred to as the tablets of the covenant. The setting of our scripture begins in Exodus 19, one chapter earlier, at the arrival when the children of Israel were, had arrived uh, from Mount Sinai and on the morning of the third day of their encampment, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud. So I'm gonna kind of read you, this is a version of the scripture that just kind of creates the synopsis of what happened and how they sort of came about biblically. And then I'll explain my view of how that is probably uh, a loose interpretation. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a very thick dark cloud People assembled at the base of the mountain, and I know that they were instructed, I remember in reading about this, they were instructed not to touch the mountain, not to uh, get close. Moses went up briefly, actually 40 days and 40 nights is what it says in another place, and returned with stone tablets. But Scott, there's tons of different accounts, and scholars have interpreted this so many different ways that it, you kind of don't care anymore because They've studied it so intensely and come up with like 12 different versions. But they differ as to if Moses was the only one to have heard all of the Decalogue or if some other people heard it too, if he did, uh, if there were other people that were allowed to go. At some point, people became afraid to hear more and moved afar off. And Moses responded with the very well-known scripture that begins with fear not. Moses drew near the thick darkness where the presence of the Lord was near. 
and he wrote it down and read it to them the next morning. So they make it sound like it happened like in a 36 hour period, but there's actually a lot of complex details about how long this process took. And actually one place I read even said it took months. We know at one point that Moses and Joshua both brought the stone tablets off the mountain. We also know there were many trips up and down the mountain. One place says eight trips. We don't know how they know that. And they were eventually placed in the Ark of the Covenant so that they could be shown to us by Charlton Heston. So in a nutshell, we have, I'll just go through them. And honestly, I tell you, if, if you would have like quizzed me, I probably could have come up with the, the later ones, but the early ones are a little muddy because they combined a couple. The first one is a combination of a statement and, and a commandment. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Then we have the second, thou shalt not make up unto thee a graven image. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. And don't covet. So I'll talk a little bit later about, um, some of them are not very controversial, are they? Some of them are pretty straightforward and have never been challenged and no one would dispute the spirit of the rule. So, you know, this is a list of things that we've known about since we were very young. And there's a common Sunday school activity. I've seen it done and I've read about it as an idea where the Sunday school teacher gathers children in a circle and the teacher takes three balls and throws them into the circle and tells the children we're playing a game on your mark, get set, go. And she waits. And a really good Sunday school teacher I think would really wait and see what happens. Usually what happens is the children get confused as to what the rules of the game are. And then they begin repeatedly asking questions to the teacher. You can picture it in your mind. It would probably be the girls that would, in my mind, that would say, what are we supposed to do? We want, we want to do the right thing. We want to follow the rules. And the teacher would say nothing. And if you let this game go along a long time, there's unrest. And sometimes the dominant kids would then take over. You can pick, because boys with a ball, I'm gonna do what I want, right? Or some girls, but my boys with a ball, they're gonna just start playing with the ball. That might upset someone, more questions, really wanting, the, the rule followers really want more clarity and they're not getting it. So maybe then there's some arguments that ensue. And that is the perfect timing for the teacher to swoop in and explain why we need rules in order to make good choices and have a group, which we think of as society or the world. In Jewish tradition, the Torah goes on to contain 613 additional commandments. Wow. Which include, I suppose if you're a rabbi, you probably know all of them. Which include duties and ceremonies and rituals, but the 10 commandments remains their theological basis. In Christian traditions, the commandments hold divine, divine authority, but there is some more interpretation. We know that Jesus refers to them. And in the Sermon on the Mount, somebody asks, Rabbi, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus explicitly references prohibition against murder and adultery. He says, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. So there he just rattled off like five of them because he, that's, that's, he knows where their theology lies. But then he says that important 
verse, honor thy father and thy mother and love thy neighbor as thyself. So we're opening up a whole new spirit of the rule. And you, it's easy to find information on different Christian faiths and how they go ahead and interpret the Ten Commandments. It's pretty interesting. In Catholicism, they're considered the moral order, essential for spiritual health and growth. Mo all of us know um, people that, that uh, practice the Catholic faith and some of their uh, devout emphases relate to the Ten Commandments specifically. They also do appear in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. There are books written solely, well, let me back up a little bit. So I wanna go back to the actual Ten Commandments. So I picked a few that I think it's interesting to think a minute about the controversy that surrounds some of them. So we just talked about different denominations. So the second one, um, thou shalt not make unto thee, unto thee a graven image. So the evolution of the Christian faith, older churches had tons of graven images of depictions of God, ornate, golden, expensive, fancy, cathedral-like depictions, um, which they did not find to be, they, it was a celebration. It was art that was a celebration of their view of God. I think there was a, definitely a need to not worship, but have an artistic, you know, Michelangelo depictions of what God looked like. I think it helped them in some way. But then along came, fast forward a whole bunch, hundreds of years, the Puritans who felt like that's a contradiction. And they went more towards uh, favoring inner spiritual growth and had none of that, no pictures. They would not have even like what we have. We have a pictures of portraits of Jesus. They would not have that because they were taking that to be their literal interpretation. No images of God or possibly Jesus. Um, keeping the set, I, and I just picked three here. I don't take the Lord's name in vain. That's not, um, th there's definitely different uh, interpretations of that. We think of it as sometimes cursing, but other interpretations that I've read had to do with don't make any supposition applying it to that God wanted it. Don't even say that I did this because God wanted me to do it. So that would be against it in interpreting. That, that was a pretty interesting one actually when I was kind of hearing about different ways that we can take the Lord's name in vain. And uh, we'll read to you a little bit. This is a Ken Davis. He's a historian and he wrote a lot of really interesting things about keeping the Sabbath holy and our interpretation of that. So we know that Christians have no monopoly on circumventing keeping the Sabbath holy. Even the Jews long ago found ways to get around the spirit, if not the letter of the law. And one of the ways they did it is they would hire Christians on their Sabbath because we conveniently had Sabbaths that were one day apart, so they would use each other to do work they needed to do so that they could be following the rule instead of breaking the Sabbath. So Jews would hire Christians to do things that needed to be done and probably vice versa, although I didn't see an instance of that. In Israel, there's even today, there's a serious contemporary conflict over doing business on the Jewish Sabbath. Politically powerful Orthodox Jews which continue to respect the Sabbath commandment and the Israeli government respects that view. So there's exceptions made to government laws because they're so connected to their religious covenants. And then in more modern uh, day, we had uh, the movie Chariots of Fire where um, there was an Olympian who refused to race in the Olympics on the Sabbath. 
and Sandy Koufax, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, would not pitch on Jewish holy days. I know lots of you are sitting here thinking of even better examples. I can feel it. I can feel it. Everybody's kind of got those interesting um, stories of how we try really hard. It's for some, it's just, it breaks you. If you break one of these, it breaks more of you. It's kind of like if I eat donuts for breakfast, it kind of screws up my whole day. Not that I don't eat, I do it, but I got it. Oh, if I eat a donut, I'm gonna eat like three donuts and then I'm like, uh, oh well. So for a lot of people, if I break, I'm rigid with the rule. If I break it, it's gonna cause um, religious uh, spiritual damage to me. And we're all supposed to be probably more like that. But. So while it's clear that the Sabbath isn't what it used to be, definitely it is worth re-examining its value, says Ken Davis. So there are many books written solely on the topic of posting the Ten Commandments in government businesses. So no matter what your beliefs are, I'm sure it is no surprise to you that it doesn't confuse anyone to know that there's controversy. Whether we believe it should be okay or not, there's controversy with the idea of posting the Ten Commandments. And I'll tell you something that I thought of this morning that's kind of interesting. When I was at Graceland, they opened up the little uh, sort of school run dance club called Choices. And in the back of Choices near the bathroom, there was a framed copy of the Ten Commandments. Somebody uh, had pointed that out to me one time and I thought, that's weird. We're talking about Choices literally and the Ten Commandments. And there was a picture, it was a little, just a little eight by 10 glass thing and it had the Ten Commandments. And I thought somebody gave, gave some thought into connecting that uh, student experience with, with, um, with our faith. So kind of funny. I think the significance to returning to this as a reflection from the very earliest days of record, we wanted some rules. They were given to humanity under the premise that God loved, they were the chosen people, God loved them, and that's why he provided the, the guidelines. They were not given as an ultimatum. It's very clear anytime uh, you research or study the scriptures right before the, the three or four or five chapters before Exodus 20 that we've been studying, talk about how God loved these people. Therefore, here is what I will give to you. And it was super dramatic. That's why the drama of the movie exists. They were not given as an ultimatum. They were given, if you do these, not, not if you do these, I will love you, but because I love you, I will give you structure and guidance. Like a parent, like a real parent. You know, I have four kids and I have said many times to many people that two of them care deeply that I am happy. And two of them, are not as interested in my happiness. And before you judge that, know that I see all of them as being compassionate, loving, amazing, and kind. But the difference is two of them will follow a rule and two of them really want to know the spirit of the rule and are probably more of questioners. So you know, you start to categorize people that you know and even yourself. People are very different in how we make choices. And I used to drive my dad crazy with questions, questions, questions. I don't think for sure, I know my brother did not ask as many questions and cause my dad as much angst as I did. There is no doubt, no one in my family would argue with that. I was constantly, desperately wanting to know why this, why that? And I'm still like that. I work in a hospital setting with thousands and thousands of rules packed with commandments. And we are challenged to know all of them. We are so challenged to know all of the hospital commandments that 
those of you that work in a hospital know, our name tag, I should have brought it up here. It's, it's a name tag, and then it's got about four extra credit card type cards on it, and it's filled with all of the commandments and things that I'm supposed to know in case the state of Missouri comes and wants to know if I am following all the rules, I can refer to this card, all these cards, it's, it's this thick, uh, and let them know that I am aware of the rules and that I'm following the rules. And it's so that there will not be chaos and confusion and delays and injury and infection and problems. So some of the rules, nevertheless, some of the rules, because there are so many, I don't agree with all of them because of inconsistencies or whatever, kind of like how we view, you know, certain things. I mean, we, we know that healthcare workers work on the Sabbath, that's inconsistency. But once I know the reasoning and the spirit behind a rule, I am its greatest champion. And I'm its greatest supporter because, you know, that's, uh, that is my makeup. I, I kind of need to know. Some people don't need to know. Oh, somebody decided it's the rule, so it's the rule. Okay. And, and they're okay with that. Nothing wrong with that. It's just not how some people are. So where are we today? What, what is our, how does this, you know, really connect to our communion experience, which we are about to partake in together? Our session causes us to reflect on the heritage as we just discussed. This is our day to reflect and renew and repent. Our invocation caused us to stop and look at ourselves. It is more difficult for us unless we stop and become self-aware. So I challenge us today to think about this past month and decisions, this past few days and decisions and choices, things that have been within our control, not things that have been out of our control. It's our duty to our fellow humans to ponder that's why we set this, this day aside and this time aside to make ourselves better so that we can be an instrument in God's hands. This worship now is our personal time. What a beautiful song we listen to. What a beautiful construction of a gathering. You know, we're doing this. This is hard. You're here today. We make a decision to get, go to our computer and log in. I hate technology. I, Brian's been up here like three times helping me figure out why can't I see this and that and are we muted and all this stuff. It's, it's so, we're overcoming little obstacles. So as we partake today, let's keep doing this. Let's be deeply, deeply present. More than you really planned on more than you thought you were going to be this morning. Let's do that. Feel the cup, feel the communion experience. If you don't have actual emblems, it's okay. You do in your mind. You've done it 5,000 times. But since, as you go away today, since your power to make choices, Small ones, large ones, the large ones require prayer and intense thought. The small ones are maybe more significant because there's a lot of them. But God is with each one of us since the beginning of time. And this is our reminder, 560 whatever BC was the first known connection with this. And it illustrates this illustration in Exodus reminds us that he is not leaving us alone. Amen.